Um, today we are going to discuss cardiac disorders or cardiology in pediatrics and the most important thing which we are going to study today is congenital heart diseases. So just to introduce, uh, tell you about uh, congenital heart disorders, uh, one thing, two things without what you cannot understand how congenital cardiac disorders they arise and how they affect the babies. So <clears throat> what I will recommend you is to go through the cardiac development how uh, in embryo the heart or cardiac tissues started developing and how um, like it become uh, differentiated into four chambers and the main arteries and the veins of the heart so uh, it is very important topic because uh, cardiac you know the heart develops from a loop and uh, in, in in embryo of course like we are not i'm not going to go in too much detail of that we don't have time for that so there is a cardiac loop or then there is septation and that and uh, it goes through <clears throat> different changes and it twists around and then like the chambers like this is the weeks and the days you can see over here and then it differentiate into the four chambers so So, uh, like, this is a very important thing to understand uh, because when you will understand this thing, then you would know how, like, how different congenital heart disorders they can occur. And the other thing which is very important to understand uh, is basically the neonatal circulation. Um, you can see over here, this one is like a diagram showing the neonatal or lot like the heart circulation before the birth. And here the red is showing the oxygenated blood and arrows indicate the direction of the blood flow. Uh, you can see over here, right? And uh, <clears throat> the highly oxygenated blood from the placenta pass to the foramen ovale, okay, which is the opening between the right and the left atrium. Uh, so the blood bypasses from the right to the left atrium because, you know, like the lungs are not functioning in in fetus so that's a very important thing to remember so a very good diagram to show you the fetal circulation is uh, the blood in the fetus or the oxygenated blood which is coming from the uh, portal veins uh, sorry umbilical veins okay what happens like there is a something called as ductus venosus which basically shunts the blood from the liver because the blood is already passed through the mother liver so there is nothing in the blood so that is basically bypassed through the fetal liver and goes into inferior vena cava and from where there the blood goes into the right atrium from right atrium most of the blood through foramen whale which is an opening between the right and the left atrium. It goes to the left atrium. From left atrium, it goes to the left ventricle, and from the left ventricle, it goes to the aorta. And from the aorta, it basically goes to the brain, through the myocardium, through to the upper extremities. One thing is this thing, and the other thing, if you will see. Uh, uh, the deoxygenated blood which is returning via uh, you can say the superior vena cava okay to the right atrium one third of the blood entering the right atrium does not flow through the foramen whale rather it flows through the right ventricle here okay so one third of the blood which is coming the deoxygenated blood I am talking about which is coming from the superior vena cava one third of the blood it doesn't go to the left left atrium rather it goes to, to it goes to the right atrium, right ventricle 
and from there what happens is uh, it goes to the pulmonary arteries and from pulmonary arteries you know it goes to the ductus arteriosus to aorta and from aorta again it goes to the systemic circulation and back to the placenta for oxygenation for reoxygenation so this is how the blood okay now you have to remember three things basically one thing is ductus venosus so ductus venosus is the connection between the umbilical vein with the inferior vena cava the other thing is for an ovale which is a opening between the right atrium and the left atrium and the third thing is ductus arteriosus okay which is basically uh, pushing the bloods from the pulmonary arteries to the aorta like usually in okay what, so what are the changes which which occur in the adults like whenever when the when the baby is born the ductus venosus closed because there is no blood is coming from the umbilical uh, veins so this 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 channel is off and what happens this foramen ovale it get closed so the blood which is from the right atrium goes to the uh, right ventricle from right ventricle it goes to the pulmonary arteries and from pulmonary arteries because this foramen ovale is sorry sorry this uh, ductus arteriosus is closed so the blood goes to the lungs for oxygenation and the, when the blood comes back it basically comes into the um, left atrium and from left atrium it goes to the left ventricle so this is like how these three changes remember um, inferior vena cava uh, the ductus venosus ductus arteriosus and foramen ovale should be closed so before birth what are the shunts are there one shunt is for deoxygenated blood that is ductus arteriosus which is shunting that deoxygenated blood from the pulmonary artery to the aorta and two shunts are for oxygenated blood so one of the shunt is for an ovale which is pushing the oxygenated blood from right to left atrium and one shunt is ductus venosus which is shunting the oxygenated blood from the umbilical vein directly into the, into the inferior vena cava so now uh, what happens is uh, simply i will scroll down the slides but i think like better to listen to me than like re reading here uh, so you can see over here that uh, the fetal circulation is designed so that oxygenated blood is more diverted towards the brain and the myocardium okay it is designed in this way and when the baby takes the first breath and the lungs open up so what happens that uh, the pulmonary resistance it decreases and when the pulmonary resistance is decreased the pulmonic blood flow increases so what happens when there is separation of low resistance placenta the systemic circulation becomes a high resistance system and due to that high resistance resistance system due to like when the placenta is cut off so placental circulation is basically low resistance circulation so when that is cut off systemic circulation become a high resistance system and when there is the, it becomes the high resistance system this one is shut off ductus venosus is closed and more and more now blood will start going to the pulmonary circulation or, or the lungs so when there is more and more blood is going to the lungs what happens now remember like the left atrium pressure is increased because the, the, the blood is coming from the lungs okay to the systemic circulation and due to this pressure foramen ovale get closed so and as soon as you know the baby take the first hand oxygen by his own, own lungs after the first breath he take there is decreased prostaglandin levels in the body this is a very important point 
when the baby take the first breath there is decreased prostaglandin levels so because of that decreased prostaglandin levels the ductus arteriosus get closed okay i will repeat a very important point because this has some clinical implications and we can use some drugs to men to play with this thing what i'm saying like whenever there is increase oxygen concentration after the baby is using his own lungs to breathe there is it causes decreased prostaglandins levels in the blood and due to these decreased prostaglandin levels in the blood basically ductus arteriosus it get closed okay so these three things are these three big changes are going on see number one is ductus venosus is closed ductus arteriosus is closed and foramen ovale is closed okay this is the change of uh, the circulation after birth so the first topic which we are going to study is congenital heart diseases right so congenital heart diseases um, occurs in up to eight births per 1000 or you can also say that it can be present up to 0.8 percent of live births okay now whenever the baby have uh, what you can say uh, a congenital heart defect okay it presents with certain signs and symptoms so uh, what can be the sign and symptoms um, the sign and symptoms could be anything like a heart murmur heart failure cyanosis anything like this feeding difficulties later on okay anything like this the most common the most common congenital heart defect is vsd or ventricular septal defect the most common congenital heart defect is vsd okay uh, nowadays you know the things are quite changed like nowadays the lesions are identified quite earlier because nowadays you know we have antenatal ultrasound screenings are available echocardiographies are available diagnostic imagings are available mris are available and uh, we have and like nowadays by the way there is interventional um, cardiology is there now sometimes they can defect uh, they can like not in all the centers but in many of the centers they can uh, fix the heart defects while the baby is still inside the mother okay so and nowadays one due to recent advances the good thing is that many of the heart defects are basically can be treated non-invasively without doing any interventions I will give you the example when I will teach you PDAs for like that that's a very important thing so the mortality is increased decreased in recent days okay uh, so now you can remember up to 0.8 percent patient uh, cases can be there okay or you can say eight cases in 1000 newborns so how we classify them is uh, like uh, the heart defects is basically there is one symptom which is like cyanosis so we, we we divide the heart condition into two main conditions cyanotic as well as acyanotic okay clinically so okay uh, what are the causes of course we are going to discuss them time by time there could be many causes like during pregnancy if there's any infections like torch infections um, there could be if the mother is taking some drugs some down syndrome for example are related with some of the heart defects okay so chromosomal abnormalities mutations things like this right 
so whenever there is congenital heart defect so of course we in the history we take we ask about the pregnancy how it goes and all this stuff common signs what the baby have feeding difficulties frequent upper respiratory tract infections sweating especially during feeding they kept me or poor weight gain and uh, especially either the baby was preterm or not and then we go for the general physical examination and the physical examination which we do and how to do physical examination you had done that thing in cardiology of course right so i think like you guys must know that thing okay regarding classification of what you can say congenital heart defects you know uh, i told you one of a very good classification is either there is the condition is asynotic or uh, synotic right here they have given the classification like left to right shunt right to left shunt or non shunt what is left to right shunt when the blood is going from the left side to the right side and there is mixing of the blood right to left shunt when shunt when the shunt is, when the blood is mixing and going from the right side to the left side now remember this thing when the blood will go from the left side to the right side so the left side have oxygenated blood and it will go to the right side uh, basically uh, these are the patients who mostly present with uh, you can say um, breathlessness okay breathlessness and whenever it is like uh, uh, <clears throat> right to left shunt so now the deoxygenated blood is going towards is mixing with oxygenated blood so there will be more uh, ox deoxygenated blood in the systemic circulation so these are the patients who present with um, cyanosis right and the third causes is of course non shunts right so like left to right shunt i will give you one example vsd and asd or ventricular septal defect or atrial septal defect they are the left to right shunt and right to left shunt is like uh, teratology of fallow uh, transposition of great arteries i will show you some videos as well and non shunts can be obstructive uh, for example if there is any obstruction in the flow of the blood for example coarctation of aorta or for example pulmonary stenosis or aortic stenosis things like this right uh, so uh, like etiology i told you uh, circulatory changes at birth i talk about them okay and uh, whenever like there is any any baby who present with any of the condition of course we go for the history and we we take all the history we ask about uh, uh, either there is any infections either the mother have diabetes any systemic conditions any drugs uh, either the baby have any syndromes and things like this and of course we go for investigations right x-ray echocardiogram EKG or ECG, chest X-ray, angiocardiography. Uh, one of the tests is called as pre and post ductal oxygen saturations. One of the tests, like one of the thing which we do, we take the blood pressure from all the four limbs, so on and so forth, right? Uh, so going going before uh, into more detail, uh, simply uh, I. I gave this classification okay so left to right shunts are basically they present with breathlessness and right to left shunt they present with cyanosis right so uh, because in this one the blood is bypassing the lungs okay so there is no oxygenation and there is cyanosis in this one of course like the blood blood does, does not bypass the lungs so there will be more breathlessness than this thing and what is cyanosis like simply it's bluish discoloration of the mucous membrane nail beds okay uh, and what what is inside the body basically there is deoxygenated hemoglobin okay is there so uh, now uh, like before moving on what you can say uh, onto onto the topic uh, what i would like to talk about is uh, the classification right a very easy way to classify uh, what you can say uh, these conditions okay uh, 
quite easy way. Oh, sorry, I want to add some slide. Okay, uh, so uh, now uh, what we are going to do is um, simply uh, how we can classify or what are the common congenital uh, heart diseases okay uh, so uh, the heart diseases can be a cyanotic or they can be um, cy sorry cyanotic right so uh, whenever it is a cyanotic uh, remember uh, two main things in this one the first thing is being what you can say uh, it could be uh, remember it is a cyanotic so it could be um, left uh, left to you can say uh, sorry wait, a left to right shunt right uh, so of course like when there is left to right shunt there is no cyanosis okay and the second cause can be obstructive type of conditions obstruct like there is obstruction in the blood flow okay uh, though there is no shunting but there is obstruction so it will not give cyanosis but it give other signs sometimes so whenever it is left to right shunt you know uh, the most common conditions you have to remember is remember atrial septal defect asd ventricular septal defect vsd uh, pda patent ductus arteriosus uh, very three common and three very easy examples uh, whenever this is there is obstruction think about um, coarctation uh, of aorta okay uh, that's the first thing uh, now see the blood leaves the heart through aortic walls so there could be aortic uh, stenosis and one of the cause or the blood from the right side of the heart leaves from the pulmonary walls so there could be um, pulmonary um, stenosis right so uh, any of these things can cause obstruction but of course no cyanosis uh, whenever it comes to the cyanosis cyanotic heart conditions um, now uh, like cyanotic heart conditions can be remembered by a mnemonic which is called as five T's okay so Remember, there are five T's, okay, uh, to, to remember the mnemonic of cyanotic heart condition. So, uh, again, uh, we can uh, remember it like simply by putting five T's together or uh, <clears throat> I will tell you, for example, first T, second T, third T, fourth T, and fifth T. Uh, I should make the size smaller. So that everything should fix in this one okay so the first one remember a very important and common acyanotic the most common is vsd but i am saying the most common cyanotic uh, teratology, teratology of fellow okay tof the second one can be transposition of great arteries then there can be total anomalous pulmonary venous drainage or you can say return okay and then there could be um, tricuspid atresia okay uh, this one and the last T is basically um, hypoplastic so you can hypoplastic okay uh, hypoplastic left uh, <clears throat> sorry five t's are oh sorry i forget uh, to mention the 50 the 50 is uh, truncus arteriosus right and the, the last one you can remember is hypoplastic um, left heart syndrome <clears throat> so these all are cyanotic and one more you can add is abs 
tea. Uh, why am I doing this thing? Because you know it can be caused by taking some drugs like lithium um, and normally and normally, right? So these are the causes of cyanotic heart failure. So remember, like the five T's. Okay, very easy to remember this thing. And the left to right shunt, like the acyanotic one, are quite easy to remember. There is some shunting going going on. ASD, VSD, and PDA. So uh, now, uh, <coughs> uh, whenever there is any heart condition. Or like in the newborn um, when there is no cyanosis so we go on the examination findings and we do x-ray uh, but whenever like for example there is uh, cyanotic so we have to think about these conditions so we take we can take a chest x-ray like in teratology of fellow there is a boot shaped heart uh, like in uh, transposition of great arteries there is a x shaped heart Okay, like in total anomalous pulmonary venous return, there is a snowman heart. So, there are like, uh, of course, like it's easy to remember because when you will keep on repeating the things, the things become easy for to remember. So, <clears throat> these are the causes. <coughs> Anyhow, uh, what I will be doing is, uh, I will show you first video, right? And uh, then we will talk about the things uh, one by one, right? Uh, I will not talk about uh, the history and all this stuff again and again, but simply uh, whenever the babies, they have congenital heart defects like, you know, nowadays, again, I told you before that it can be diagnosed prenatally, right? But on birth, you know, the baby can present with any symptom, symptom like cyanosis, like breathlessness, like poor feeding, like sweating, like recurrent chest infections, okay? And... The signs could be poor weight gain, tachypnea, tachycardia, heart murmurs, enlarged heart or enlarged liver, cool paraphrase, anything can be there, okay? And whenever like it comes to the heart murmurs, of course, like, you know, we we, uh, we see either, it's a, a very interesting topic, by the way. I think we can discuss this thing before going in more detail on to the congenital heart defects. You know, murmurs are a very common thing, right? So what happens is, like, basically, um, the parents, okay, uh, they, they, they come to the doctors uh, with complaints of murmurs, okay? So there is something called as innocent murmur, innocent murmur, okay? So what happens, like, uh, uh, as, you know, the most common presentation of congenital heart defect is heart murmur, Again, this is a very important thing. And by the way, when you go for exams like, you know, steps or PLAB, you know, they ask you questions like this. What is the most common cause of this or that? So the most common presentation, what I'm saying, for the heart murmur is basically, for the heart, congenital heart defect is heart murmur. So uh, uh, now, you know, like uh, when I was working in pediatrics, uh, many times, you know, the parents will come and they say that, you know, the doctor, they examine their child and the, the child, the doctor is saying that, you know, uh, that the baby has some murmur. So we are concerned. So uh, majority of the children, they have heart murmur, but basically that is an innocent murmur. Uh, again, there is mnemonic, so remember the features of innocent murmurs. But uh, how we distinguish uh, uh, innocent murmur with the other murmurs and the mnemonic which I, I'll be, I will be telling you is like um, innocent murmurs have a lot of S, okay? Uh, so like, you know, uh, I know the spelling which I'm writing here is not for innocent, but you can write innocent like this, okay? So of course, this is not the correct spelling for innocent. So innocent murmur, what we are discussing is innocent murmur, you know, innocent murmur have a lot of S, okay? So. Uh, what are those S is basically uh, the patient is asymptomatic. A second feature is the patient have soft blowing murmur. Like the murmur doesn't sound harsh, rather it's a soft murmur. And the third S, remember, if the murmur is always systolic murmur. Okay. So uh, with the basically, uh, whenever we hear any murmur in the heart, we try to time it out and... Uh, if the like the murmur is between S1 and S2, it means like it is systolic. If it is between S2 and S1, it is a diastolic murmur. So, a systolic murmur, uh, 
A diastolic murmur can never be innocent murmur. A harsh murmur cannot be uh, innocent murmur, uh, murmur. Or a symptomatic patient's can, can patient murmur um, cannot be uh, innocent murmur. And also, uh, the murmur location most commonly is left, sorry, sternal um, edge, like just on the left of the sternal edge. And uh, uh, what you can say, there is normal S1 and S2, okay, uh, and uh, again, there is no para, again, sternal heave or thrill. So uh, basically, when we, we when we feel their precordium, we, we we see like if we feel anything on the precordium or not. So of course, like in this one, we cannot uh, like uh, there is no thrill. And one more thing, you know, uh, the murmurs like pathological murmurs they radiate. For example, the murmurs of mitral valve uh, they radiate towards the axilla. And the murmurs of aortic valve, they, they radiate towards the carotids. So remember, like, innocent murmurs never radiate, right? So, like, they, there is no radiation in this one. So they don't radiate. So, like, these are the features of innocent murmurs, okay? So, uh, simply, um, uh, whenever, like, when we'll, when we'll be studying all these conditions, I'm not going to talk about uh, much of the things, like history and all this stuff, but, like, I will tell the things which are associated with those conditions. So, <clears throat> we have done the topic cyanosis, so I don't think so. We have to discuss that thing again. But, you know, like, cyanosis could be central and could be peripheral. And cyanosis, uh, <coughs> uh, whenever it is central, so it means, like, there could be some cyanotic heart conditions, okay? Or respiratory defects or infections or metabolic diseases. Like, that's a different discussion anyways. So, um, now... Uh, when we will uh, we will start our discussion uh, with uh, what you can say atrial septal defect okay <clears throat> atrial septal defect this is the first topic uh, i will be taking so uh, first of all remember like it is a atrial septal defect is a asynotic heart condition right asynotic congenital heart condition atrial septal defect is a left to right shunt right now if you if you have the knowledge or if you have a good uh, knowledge of the physiology of the heart you must know that uh, the left atrium have more pressure than the right atrium even the left ventricle have more pressure than right ventricle so the blood will flow from the left or right left side of the heart to the right side of the heart okay not in the opposite direction of course makes sense so uh, now uh, the important thing over here to remember about uh, the asynotic heart condition is what um, <clears throat> three things three factors you can say which can um, demonstrate or tell you like either there will be any clinical features or what kind of clinical features will be there. Number one, the size of the defect. Either atrial septal defect is small size, big size or very big size. Second thing, what is the pressure difference between two vessels or chambers? And the third thing is peripheral outflow resistance, right? These three determine a lot of things. So if we will talk about ASD, so uh, now uh, ASD is of these three types okay one is ostium primum one is ostium secundum and was one is sinus venosus um, these are the pictures which are given over here okay the ostium secundum is the most common type up to 70 percent of the times you will found this thing this type up to 70 percent Okay, or you can say 50 to 70 percent. Ostium secundum is the most common one. Ostium primum type is the one which is basically um, associated with um, Down syndrome. Okay, 
the babies who have Down syndrome, they have, they, they may have osteophyllum type. Uh, and osteum uh, sinus venosus is uh, basically the defect which is located uh, at the entry of superior vena cava into the right atrium. Remember, osteum secundum is the most common type, okay? Some of the books mention it up to 80%. So, but that, that doesn't make any difference. You just have to remember, this is the most common type and this is the one which is associated with Down syndrome. No matter what type is there, they present with the same signs and symptoms. Though their anatomy is quite different, but uh, the sign and symptoms remain the same. So basically the secundum is the one uh, which is in the center of atrial septa. Okay. Uh, so uh, I think like I will, I will show you uh, first of all a video and then you can uh, like we can discuss discuss it further uh, because like a good animation you know uh, is going to give you a good idea how it looks like right so wait I'm going to show you the video okay uh, wait like resize this thing because I don't use any sophisticated softwares you know to record this lecture so I am going in quite conventional way uh, so we can see this one the heart center at nationwide children's is the most common type of ASD is called a secundum atrial septal defect a secundum atrial septal defect is a hole in the wall between the two upper chambers of the heart. Before birth, it is normal to have an opening called the patent foramen ovale in this wall. This opening usually closes shortly after birth. Sometimes the wall between the chambers doesn't develop completely. As a result, an abnormal hole called an atrial septal defect is left in the middle of the wall. This opening allows blood to move between the upper chambers, which increases blood flow to the lungs. If the hole is large enough, the increased blood flow leads to enlargement of the heart and can also damage the blood vessels in the lungs. It can also lead to abnormal heart rhythm due to injury to the heart muscle. Most children do not have symptoms, but those with a large defect can have slow growth and rarely a condition called congestive heart failure. Treatments for ASD may include medications for symptoms, but the definitive treatment is closure by either cardiac catheterization or surgery. If the hole is large or hasn't closed by age two to five years, a catheter or surgical procedure may be necessary. During a catheter procedure, a tube called a catheter is inserted through a small incision in the child's groin. From there, the catheter will be threaded through blood vessels to the child's heart. Next, the doctor will place a device called an atrial septal occluder across the defect to plug the hole. The device will stay in the heart and prevent blood from crossing between the upper chambers. Then, the catheter will be removed from the body. When the hole is too big or when there is no place to attach the device, open heart surgery is necessary to close the hole. To begin, the surgeon will make an incision in the chest. Once the heart is reached, the hole will be closed with a patch. The incision will be closed and covered with sterile dressings. Our Heart Center team at Nationwide Children's is dedicated to supporting your child. 
We are available to answer all of your questions at any time at six. Okay, so basically this one is taken from a hospital website. So uh, now um, the important thing to tell you here is basically this is a very con small video, but giving a lot of answers uh, or tell you what how the condition looks like. Uh, though ASD just uh, like uh, out of all the cardiac defects, you know, it is around six to eight percent of all the cardiac defects. Uh, most of the patients who have atrial septal defects, you know, uh, most of them, they are asymptomatic, okay. And when the diameter of ASD is less than, like, uh, ASD diameter, um, less than 8 millimeter, okay, uh, it closes spontaneously, spontaneously, okay, uh, okay, so in up to 100% of patients, up to, uh, like not all, remember, up to 100% means, uh, you can say 80 to 100% of the patients, so this is the natural history, okay, one very important thing which she mentioned in the video and I want to make you clear, Remember the last stage for any kidney disease can be what? A renal failure. The last stage for any liver disease can be what? A liver failure. The same thing, the last stage for any heart illness or heart condition will be a heart failure or congestive heart failure. So, most of the patients, they are asymptomatic especially in their childhood they are asymptomatic and whenever they grow up you know they, they can show some signs like uh, a murmur the murmur is the most common presentation of the uh, you can say of uh, the children with uh, heart defects right congenital heart defects so what murmur we get is a uh, ejection systolic murmur which is basically best heard at the uh, left sternal edge or you can say upper left sternal edge. So uh, this thing is important and one more thing um, there is wide fixed splitting of the second heart sound. Um, but yes this one. S2 is widely split and often fixed and uh, like, like if you know like the S2 have two components um, you can say A2 and P2 and the pulmonary valve it closes uh, uh, you can say aortic valve closes like both of them they closes with a little difference okay uh, but like in this one because the pressure equalizes so now uh, like the, the two sounds they are quite separated okay and they are fixed so uh, that's why s2 is like in this case like uh, in asd it will be widely fixed and uh, like and in normal people what happens like when we do inspiration and expiration uh, what happens is like the splitting of the second heart sounds it keep on changing because there is more cardiac output uh, when we are inspiring. Uh, inspiration is going on. Okay, so that's what go, what happens in these patients. Like uh, in normal people, the splitting is there, uh, but there is no splitting during the inspiration phase, right? So they have a widely fixed S2 sound. So no matter if they are in inspiration or expiration, their S2 will be split. So, this is the thing which we can see and you know like uh, whenever there is murmurs, you know, the cardiologists, they grade the murmur depending on how loud is the murmur. So, the grade of this murmur is, murmur is like 2 to 3, uh, like the <clears throat> largest grade is 6, okay. So, you can say it's uh, uh, not so loud, rather uh, moderate in intensity murmur. 
So uh, whenever like the patients, they show the, they started showing the signs, they can show any sign like failure to thrive, uh, congestive heart failures and things like this, right? So uh, now, you know, whenever there is any, any heart defects, you know, we go for chest x-ray, we go for echo, we go for ECG. Uh, so ECG is, uh, remember, the best test to diagnose or to uh, get the information about any congenital heart defect, not just congenital, rather any type of heart condition, is echocardiography. Echocardiography is the test of choice to check any structural abnormality of the heart, you can say. So when we do a chest x-ray, Maybe we can see cardiac enlargement. Uh, when we will do ECG in these patients, maybe you will find uh, right ventricular hypertrophy because you know the blood is shunting from the left at left ventricle, uh, sorry, left atrium to the right atrium, and more and more blood is going to the right ventricle. So the right ventricle is working is in overload. There is more load on the right ventricle, so there could be right ventricular hypertrophy. Okay, and the best test, as I told you, is echocardiography. Of course, echocardiography is going to show you the picture. You can see over here the echocardiography of the heart. This is the left ventricle. This is the right ventricle. This is the left atrium. This is the right atrium, and there is the opening over here. This is for an well. Or again, one more echocardiographic view. We can say right atrium and left atrium, and there is an opening in between. Nowadays, color flow dopplers are also there and we can see the mixing of the blood easily, right? So left atrium, right atrium and ASD is there, right? So this thing. Uh, so how we manage this patient's uh, complications, as I told you, the ultimate complication will be congestive heart failure okay what is isn't manger syndrome uh, this is a very interesting thing uh, remember like in the start this is a uh, left to right shunt but as this condition will run for a long period of time what will happen that uh, due to more and more shunting of the blood from the left side to the right side right side of the heart have to work more and more and more and there will be hypertrophy so there will be a stage uh, a stage will reach when the right heart pressure will be increased too much and the right heart muscles will be hypertrophic. So now uh, there will be one stage when the blood will start, uh, like the pressure in both of the heart sides will be equal, will equalize and there will be no mixing. But after that, the next stage is when the right heart is so much hypertrophic that, uh, that the blood will now start flowing from the right side of the heart to the left side of the heart. So reversal of this thing is called as Eisenmenger syndrome. So now how we manage these patients, basically uh, uh, children with less than eight millimeter size of VSD, ASD, sorry, it closes spontaneously. But whenever like they are showing some signs and symptoms, uh, we can do elective surgical closure. Uh, nowadays by the use of catheters, right, right? Can be done. And most of the time it is done between age two to five years of age, right? So most of the time they they do it around two to five years of age, and especially like when the patients when the babies they are started having symptoms. So after that the next topic is VSD. Now remember guys VSD are the most common congenital heart defects. Up to fifty percent of the patients they have this thing, and uh, majority of the cases have basically. Uh, the a small VSD okay so what is small VSD uh, basically they are smaller than the aortic wall when their diameter is like up to 3 millimeter so that, that is basically a small VSD uh, now uh, you can see over here uh, this is a VSD in the membranous portion of the heart and this is like a VSD in the suprapistal portion uh, there, there is a VSD in the muscular portion of the heart. So like these are the different types depending on the location, okay? And 
like the types are depending on the location and then we check the size as well either it's small vsd either it's moderate to large vsd okay so small vsd when the size is up to three millimeters simply is called as small vsd so <clears throat> uh, pathophysiology leaves this thing and what is going on uh, the moderate vsd is basically a vsd uh, or moderate to large VSD, we can say, uh, when the defect is bigger than the aortic wall, we call it as large VSD. Okay, so that's how we classify them. So now, um, clinical findings, you know, majority of the patients, they have a small VSD and they remain asymptomatic. Uh, again, like you can, you can see a video uh, which will help you uh, understand the thing better. Okay, so... I will show you video for that one. ASD refers to an opening in the interventricular septum that separates the two ventricles of the heart. In normal circulation, oxygen-poor blood from the body returns to the right side of the heart where it is pumped into the pulmonary artery and to the lungs. After being oxygenated, oxygen-rich blood from the lungs returns to the left side of the heart to be pumped into the aorta and out to the body. A VSD allows abnormal blood flow between the two ventricles. The net flow of blood, called a shunt, is usually from left to right due to significantly higher blood pressure in the left side of the heart. This is because the left side has to pump blood all over the body, while the right side only needs to send it to the lungs. If the defect is small, the shunt is negligible and does not result in any symptoms. A large defect, on the other hand, may overload the right side of the heart, causing it to fail. Heart failure symptoms usually appear during the first few weeks of life and include fatigue, shortness of breath, difficulty feeding, and poor growth. Without treatment, other complications may also occur. As the right ventricle continuously pumps more blood to the lungs, the entire pulmonary vasculature may be overloaded and pulmonary hypertension may result. To overcome the high pressure in the lungs, the right ventricle has to generate even higher pressure, which eventually becomes greater than that of the left ventricle. This reverses the direction of the shunt, causing oxygen-poor blood to flow from right to left and be sent to all tissues of the body. The resulting oxygen deprivation may be seen as bluish skin color, known as cyanosis. A VSD can happen alone or in combination with other congenital defects in conditions such as Down syndrome or Tetralogy of Fallot. The cause is unknown but likely to involve both genetic and environmental factors. The turbulence of abnormal blood flow in VSD produces heart murmurs, which can be heard using a stethoscope. Diagnosis is confirmed by echocardiography. VSD is the most common congenital heart defect in infants, but the defect is small in most cases. Small defects usually close on their own in early childhood, and no treatment is needed. Large defects that produce symptoms usually require surgical closure in the first year of life. Okay, so as you can see, like from the video you can see like the small VSD they are basically asymptomatic normal growth normal development uh, only like when you will are going to hear the murmur what you will be founding is a sonic murmur because when the heart is contracting going into systole the blood will flow from that VSD so a hollow systolic murmur best heard at lower left sternal border LLSP so we can do a uh, ECG, chest x-ray, echo, but echo is the to confirm the diagnosis and most of these closer spontaneously. Whenever the VSD is moderate to large, uh, again now, as you can see, the patient can present with symptoms like delayed growth because see, the, the, the body is not getting, getting enough blood. Much of the blood is shunting back to the lungs, which will cause 
uh, pulmonary hypertension in the long run as well as you can say uh, Eselmenger syndrome. So the body is not getting any bl enough blood. There will be delayed growth, uh, decreased exercise tolerance, more and more upper respiratory tract infections. And again, when you were examining them, you are going to find a holosystolic murmur at uh, left lower sternal border in these cases. So we can do the same investigations, ECG, chest x-ray, and echo, and echo will be diagnostic. So like in ECG, you can see like in normal, 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 small VSD, it will be normal, but in large VSD, there could be right ventricular hypertrophy or left ventricular hypertrophy. Okay. And uh, X-ray of the small VSD, everything is normal, but X-ray of a moderate VSD, maybe there is cardiomegaly and X-ray of a large VSD, see the heart is quite larger. Uh, we, we check like how much is the heart diameter. If it is more than the uh, half of the diameter of the chest, it means like there is cardiomegaly. And echo will diagnose, see, right ventricle and left ventricle and there is VSD, abnormal communication. So, uh, simply complications, as I told you, Eselmenger syndrome, congestive heart failure, pulmonary edema, and fetimidopyritis. So guys, treatment of this one remains same. Small VSD, spontaneous closure is there. No surgical intervention is there. Large VSD, of course, we treat them and the closure should be done by the age of, uh, what you can say, one year of age, okay? Uh, and if there is congestive heart failure, of course, treat that. So the, like this is all about VSD and ASD. And we will continue this lecture in the in the next next one hour lecture as well. So I will see you around.